gentlemen. Tonight we're going to consider one of the major events of the last decade in this, uh, in the, at this time, and uh, in particular the insufficiently explored here subject of the unification of Germany. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is both to discuss that major issue but also to applaud and launch a remarkable book that's been written on the subject of the unification of Germany by two of our forum speakers. I'll introduce them very soon, but before I do so, let me begin by saying that we're especially honored to have here the new ambassador of Germany to the United States, uh, Herr Krobog, who is here beside me. Um, a very distinguished... Uh, A very distinguished foreign servant who was trained as a lawyer and subsequently served in Singapore in the United Nations, in the European community as it then was in Brussels, and then became the political director of the German Foreign Office, and in that capacity served in particular the famous foreign minister of Germany, uh, Herr Genscher. He was present at one historical great moment after another. I think he can well claim to be an immortal already, and no doubt after we've heard him this evening, we'll understand why. Our second speaker tonight is Karl Kaiser. He's political science professor at the University of Bonn and also the director of the Institute of, German, uh, of, of, of Foreign Affairs in Germany. Um, but he's much more than that. I've known Karl Kaiser for quite a long time, and he embodies in himself both the Atlantic and the European vocations of Germany. He is in many ways, if the ambassador will forgive me for saying so, one of the finest unofficial ambassadors that Germany has ever produced, and a man who is widely known throughout the whole of Europe and the United States and Canada. Beside him, we have the two authors. The two authors of a remarkable book called German Unification and the Transformation of Europe. And uh, these two authors are Condoletza Rice and our own Philip Zelico. Let me say a word about each of them. Uh, Condoletza Rice is the provost of Stanford University. Um, she's also been an extremely distinguished member of the National Security Council and was the direct special assistant to the president on issues of national security and the director of the uh, section of the NSC concerned with the Soviet Union and East European affairs. Uh, she was described, if I may give away a secret, earlier today by the ambassador as one of the most brilliant NSC members he'd ever encountered. And she is, of course, a great disappointment to Harvard because we were hoping to have her here. <laughs> uh, next to her is our own Philip Zelico, who, as you know, is a professor here at the Kennedy School who was also a member of that very distinguished team within the Bush administration on the National Security Council and who, apart from uh, fulfilling that role and doing so in a very distinguished manner, has also made a major contribution to the whole study of international relations and international institutions. Um, one of the things that I hold him in greatest honor for was that he's written one of the most uh, enlightened and I think enlightening cases ever written about Northern Ireland, not an easy thicket to walk into, and cast a great deal of light on the transformation of the Northern Ireland police. So that's our team, as they say in uh, some of the television shows I occasionally watch. And it'll be my pleasure to ask each of them to speak for between seven and ten minutes. I shall be a tough chairperson. We will then open it up to questions, and I'll give each of them just two minutes at the end to respond to anything that has come up that they feel hasn't been adequately enlightened by them. And I've told them that each one has to produce an immortal soundbite to conclude the evening. So first of all, Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Germany to the United States. Thank you, Professor Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, I confess I, I belong to this doubtful group of pensionists in Germany, but I think that's the time now to reveal that, and without any problems, I believe. Uh, let me just jump into our topic. I believe Mrs. Rice and Mr. Zelikov have produced an extremely well-written and researched portrayal of the unification process. It will be of a great value to politicians, diplomats, and historians alike. For the most part, I agree with their depiction. I personally would, however, attribute more importance to the contribution that Europe, and in particular Germany, made to the easing of the East-West relations, which ultimately made unification possible. 
Perhaps you have to read the books of Genscher, of Baker, of others, to get the full picture of what happened during that time. But I must say that what you have written is of an extreme importance, and it is extremely uh, important to know. The 2 plus 4 negotiations were able to benefit from the gradual easing of East-West relations during the Gorbachev years, when long-held distrust began to fade and trust began to develop. The CC process, which led to this new approach, was initiated and kept alive by Germany over many years, and it took until Baker took over as a, uh, foreign, as a state secretary in the United States, until the Americans really believed in this CEC process. I still recall the criticism Genscher experienced after the speech he delivered in Davos on February 1, 1987, when he appealed to the West to take Gorbachev at his word. And I remember the discussions we had with other foreign ministers and other foreign ministries in Europe, where they always raised the issue, the question, will Gorbachev survive? And our response always was, we have to do whatever we can to make him survive. That was a German approach compared to the approach of many other countries in Europe. The decision taken by NATO in April 89 to refrain from the modernization of thought range missiles, and you write about in your, that in your book, I think this was a crucial milestone which the German side achieved against the initial resistance by the parties. And I would say that for me at least, it was really the most important event. If we have taken another decision during that time, I think the history would have developed in a different way. The 1989 NATO resolution at the Turnberry Council and London Summit is even of an utmost importance. The East and West no longer saw each other as enemy. The West offered to cooperate with the Warsaw Pact. This outcome was brought about through the joint US-German efforts against the resistance among many of our partners in Europe, many of our European NATO partners. A personal relationship developed between Gorbachev and Shevardnadze on the Soviet side, and the major players on the American and especially German sides is even very important. For instance, Genscher and Shevardnadze were members of the same generation which was strongly influenced by the experiences and consequences of the Second World War. I had the chance to assist many meetings between Genscher and Shevardnadze, actually at all of them, and I know how long it took, but how important it was to build up this atmosphere of confidence between these two men. And this was finally very helpful when we talked about the future membership of NATO, of Germany in NATO. And I remember especially the meeting in Brest, which you very nicely described in your book, and the meeting, the, the reception of uh, Shevard Nath in Münster, in the German town of Münster, where for the first time, felt that he was very welcome in Germany. And later on, after the unification, he met people in Halle and Weimar in the eastern part of Germany, not knowing if he would be welcome or not, and he was very welcome. I think that was very important for the future afterwards. Even before the two and two plus four process got underway, there was a growing German-American consensus which lasted until the conclusion of the negotiations. This point has been clearly made by Zölika Reis. The Americans did not have any reservation or fears about a unified Germany. The United States dispelled any such doubts on the part of the French and British and other governments right from the start of the West preparation for the two plus four talks. And our German gratitude towards the United States is rooted in these facts. The 10-point program of November 28, 89, introduced by Chancellor Kohl was a very critical date with which the German side established in the unification process. It was the first initiative to lay down the political steps needed to be taken once developments in the GDR became clear. Even if this plan itself became obsolete later on, it was the first main first step on the German side. And finally, whenever we discuss the unification process, we must always keep in mind 
that in 1989 the GDR power structure collapsed mainly from within. This was due to the East German people participating in the Monday demonstrations in Leipzig and other cities. It was a change from we are the people to we are one people. And finally, it was a round table discussions between December 1989 and March 1990 that broke the power hold of the Communist Party. In short, it was primarily an East German development, influenced from the outside, influences from the outside played a secondary role at best. In 1990, the Soviet Union finally decided to give up the GDR in an accelerated process and even and agreed even to consent to Germany's membership in NATO. Their decision was significantly influenced by internal German developments. After the elections of the People's Chamber in March 1990, all that remained of the GDR was an empty shell of government, a country unwinding. This book you have written is now history. How do things look today and how will they look in the future? In association with unification, polemic voices were warning against the Fourth Reich, others against the Germany that would use its new weight to assert self-seeking national goals. From the other direction, complaints were being made of a Germany that would not live up to its international responsibility because it would have to dedicate itself entirely to internal unification. None of these fears have occurred. Germany continues to pursue a policy that is aimed at deepening and enlarging the European Union and thus at stabilizing Europe as a whole. Despite the immense cost of rebuilding Eastern Germany, German financial appropriations for the EU have remained, have remained at their high level. Contributions to developing Central and Eastern Europe are higher than those of any other major Western countries, including the United States. Humanitarian aid for the former Yugoslavia, including the roughly 400,000 war refugees in Germany, is higher than that of all Western Europe together. The 1994 decision of the Federal Constitutional Court has made it possible for German forces to be deployed as part of international peacekeeping or peacemaking efforts when the German parliament consents. Germany currently has about 4,000 soldiers participating in I-4. The German parliament recently approved the German contribution to I-4 with over overwhelming votes, also from the SPD and votes from the Greens. The outcome was 537 to 107, who had thought that one year ago. The result of the vote shows how much a political mood in Germany has changed over the last two years. A majority of German people also now support the idea that Germany should assume the same responsibility and the same risk as its partner and allies. And I think that is very important also for the United States because they will have a partner participating in the burden sharing in conflict management and crisis uh, prevention and management. I think Germany has come of age. Thank you very much. speaker is Karl Kaiser. Karl Kaiser. When on a warm summer evening um, I was sitting with Condoleezza Rice opposite the Drachenfels in a small place called the Weinhäuschen, which I recommend, where we were talking how the ongoing turmoil in Europe would not lead to trouble in our relations with the Soviet Union and unleash unforeseeable events. Of course, we did not foresee that the Soviet Union would collapse, Germany would be unified, that she would write a book about it, and that we would be sitting here tonight to discuss it. The book is splendid. I recommend it warmly. Having written the first one immediately afterwards, I only envy both for the quality, but also because they've set a new standard. And I really do hope that others will follow, because it is the first book on a major international event, 
in which the authors had access to sources normally social scientists don't get. So I do hope that other governments and the American government follow that very good example and that social scientists will have the kind of access that you had. I would like to uh, devote the few minutes that I have on three remarks. First, on the relationship between actors and historical circumstances in this case. After all, we all know the German division was a product of the Cold War. When the Cold War came to an end, wasn't it a foregone conclusion that the division of Germany had to end? After all, the division, Germany was the very core, the heart of the East-West conflict. The way Germany would go, it was very clearly felt on both sides, on both sides would decide the way the great conflict between East and West would go. However, in 89, when things began to change, it was not a foregone conclusion. There were many options available. And in order to understand what went on, we must keep in mind that actors acted within a framework of circumstances on the basis of an acquis on a foundation that had been created before. The book focuses on 89 to 1990, does that splendidly. And of course it refers to the framework that had been created. But I'd like to draw your attention to the preceding 40 years without which the events of 1989 and 90 would never have occurred. And it goes back really to the 1940s. And I would argue the unification of Germany and the end of Europe's division and the end of the Cold War is the unusual, possibly unique outcome of a strategy that was actually devised in the 1940s. That is very rare, that a strategy works on such a complex issue. Let's keep in mind that after World War II, lessons were drawn from World War I, that a treaty or a peace settlement based, like in Versailles, on the notion of controlling or discriminating against a country that was inevitably stronger and larger than the others wouldn't work, and that another approach had to be chosen. And the approach was actually chosen. And that was the approach of integration, of pooling of resources, of creating a framework that would accommodate one day a united Germany. That was the vision of the Atchison's, of the Monets, of the Schumachers, and the Adenauers. And lo and behold, 40 years later, it worked. And it would not have worked had the framework not been created and there. It was the framework of European integration and of integration in the West. Although at that time, the creation of NATO was not that much seen in the context of German unification as was European unification, but it was also seen in that context. So, when we look then at the situation of 1989, there was what, in fact, in 1989, at a summer seminar at the Center for European Studies of this university, was called then by Stanley Hoffman, a structure d'accueil, a structure that can accommodate what is, seems to be happening there, the recreation of a powerful united Germany. The structure was there. It had been developed in several decades, it had given Germany the possibility to show that it could responsibly handle power. The recreation of a united Germany was not a problem. The democracy was firm. And so it worked. But it worked only because the framework was there, the framework of Western integration, and the preceding period of accommodation with the East. The Soviet Union of 1989 would not have agreed to recreating Germany had there not been the preceding period of redefining the relationship with the Soviet Union during the new Ostpolitik, the period of détente. So it means that the two great innovations of the post-war period, which were taken within Germany, always in full um, agreement with the Western powers, namely integration in the West, and a new relationship with the East were the precondition for then doing these unusual things that happened. And, but the framework was there, but it had to be seized. And there we have had the luck 
of an unusual constellation of personalities as well as of administrations. Uh, when you go back to other major moments of history, take the, the period after World War I, for example, and compare the relationship of the major actors, the major statesmen of that period with the period of 1989. These were all experienced politicians who knew each other, who trusted each other, who were actually friends partially, uh, and then in a remarkably short time produced this extraordinary success less than a year between the fall of the wall and the recreation of Germany in October 1990. So you had actors that seized the opportunity and that then shows that the role of personalities is and continues to be absolutely vital. But they do need a framework and circumstances within which to act. They existed too. And so the, the key actors, no doubt, were um, the heads of the government in the United States, uh, Germany, and uh, in the Soviet Union. France, with some hesitation, came along, used the framework too. Britain, so to speak, under the pressure of events, finally also fell in line, and then it could work. It is a splendid example, a rare example of what the Germans call Staatskunst, the art of diplomacy, which worked. However, that takes me to my second point. The book uh, brings it out very, uh, very well. The most amazing part of unification was that the Soviet Union acceded to unification in NATO. After all, the alliance that had been the the enemy alliance on the other side. And when you read the book, you understand why. You see the arguments being produced uh, by the Americans, by the Germans uh, in particular. And the argument remains relevant to this day. The argument is that the creation of circumstances where a neutral, powerful Germany uh, would come into existence would be tantamount to destroying the structure of cooperation that had emerged in the post-war period. A structure of cooperation which meant the denationalization of military policies which had been at the origin of the tragedies of Europe, transparency in military policy, close co cooperation among the military. Um, all of that would go down the drain at the same time. To reunify Germany, not in NATO, would have been tantamount to destroying the very assets that had been at the basis of creating what was a system of peace in the Atlantic world. And to the surprise of the Soviet Union, you will remember, and it is described in the book, the East European allies of the Soviet Union wanted unification in NATO, and after a lot of doing and with a great deal of help, the Soviet leadership came around to accepting that in the end that was better. And the arguments that convinced the Soviets at that time to, uh, uh, ex to agree to unification in NATO remain valid today. That structure continues to be an immensely important structure to maintain a system of cooperation that has provided for peaceful cooperations within the Western world which could extend stability to the East. So the lesson that we can draw from this process, which is described in the book, remains relevant for the years ahead. And one can only wish that President Clinton, in now uh, asking the Congress and the American people to take part with a significant contribution uh, in this NATO operation, that it will succeed, that the isolationists in this country will not prevail, because that is nothing but a continuation of a policy that has worked very well for the last decades and that has produced stability. Finally, um, the book brings out very well the connection between the unification and the acceleration of European integration. The Maastricht Treaty owes its existence to the acceleration of events with regard to German unity and the breakdown of the old East-West division. It was clear. In particular, Chancellor Kohl and Mitterrand uh, accepted that after a short hesitation and became, the two became then the core of a new initiative that the unification of Germany must lead to an acceleration of European Union. The, 
the President of the Commission, also recognized that, supported it. East Germany became a member uh, of the European community, uh, and at the same time, the Intergovernmental Conference produced the treaty. Uh, the logic of the Maastricht Treaty goes back to this process of German unification, to the fact that the division of uh, Europe came to an end. However, it was also a treaty that came about under the impact still of the old threat. Uh, it owes a great deal to a perception of a world which was about to collapse. And this is why now the European Union has problems. However, I think the basic lesson that was drawn at the time by the Europeans that the recreation uh, of Germany uh, would in fact increase the need to implement the very vision that the statesmen of the 1940s had that a totally different order had to emerge in Europe based on the concept of integration and pooling of sovereignty. That idea hasn't lost its value. On the contrary, it seems to me that in a world of growing anarchy, uh, the necessity of maintaining and strengthening uh, that framework is evident, uh, although in the forthcoming conference on the revision of the Maastricht Treaty, no doubt, uh, the members of the Union will not advance as fast as uh, many Europeans want. I think the logic uh, of that undertaking has only been increased by the events of 1989 and 90, and we owe a great deal to the two authors who have helped us to understand that process better. Thank you. Now our first author, Philip Zellico. First, I'd like to thank the Kennedy School for having given me a place to do the research that produced this book. And second, I'd like to thank Professor Williams for the very warm and unduly kind introduction uh, that she offered in, for both myself and, uh, and the other speakers on whom her introduction was all too accurate. The uh, uh, preface I'd like to begin with my remarks is to tell you the big danger that we worried about when we were writing this book. Um, Winston Churchill, after the end of the First World War, wrote an, auto, wrote an account of the First World War called The World Crisis. And uh, Earl Balfour, after this book came out, uh, commented that, uh, I see that Winston has written his autobiography disguised as a history of the world. Uh, we wanted to be sure we avoided this accusation. The way we... Uh, the way we tried to avoid this accusation is we wanted to be sure we wrote um, an international history, that we didn't just try to write this story from our perspective so that the reader would naturally assume that all these events came to happen only because the authors happened to be at the scene performing those events which they're now so splendidly recording for us. Um, it might be nice, but it would be wrong. Let me use that then as a preface to my four remarks. The first follows from what I've just said, which is actually a caution to those who try to construct narratives of events. Maybe some of those people are historians. Maybe some of them are journalists. Uh, some of you here, I think, will find this task formally or informally. The caution is a caution to do international history. It is easy enough to say, here's how we thought things were happening. It's very important then to also take the time to understand their world and how all these events are being perceived in their world. And in our case, uh, we felt uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to review uh, um, the relevant documents from the United States, uh, many relevant documents from the Soviet archives, and many East German documents, as well as everything that had been written on this subject in English, German, and Russian, and the relevant secondary materials as well. This allowed us to broaden our perspective so that we could try to write, and with, especially with Condi's help, a portrait of Gorbachev's world. What did he think was happening? Then you can compare that with what the Americans thought were happening. And when you make, and what the Germans thought were happening, what Cole and Genscher thought they were contributing. And when you do that, you really begin to capture the synergy and dynamic that really characterizes diplomacy today. And also you begin to understand, and when you understand, your own, under, your own policies, your own country's viewpoint 
can only be improved and enhanced. History there should therefore be international, and let me add, it should also be multifunctional. I was trained in political military affairs, and it's an easy temptation then to ignore economic affairs as incomprehensible and undoubtedly unimportant. But it would be wrong. Economic affairs were important in this story. So you have to make that effort to reach beyond the subject you know well, not only the country, but even the functional field you know well, and grasp all of the relevant fields that might concern your subject. The second reflection I'd like to offer is it's really a good idea to think about what you want. Think about what you really want. You see, you can be confronted by the conventional wisdom. It says, we don't care what you want. Here's what's possible. Nevertheless, take the time to think about what you want. In November 1988, Margaret Thatcher announced publicly that the Cold War was over. I talked to the reporter who recorded the statement, and he said she, it wasn't a chance remark. She said it, repeated it, and made sure he wrote it down. The Cold War is over, November 1988, but Europe's still divided. Still hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the heart of Europe poised against each other. But to her, the Cold War was over. The modus vivendi that satisfied her had been reached, which then should provoke you to think, how does one define the end of the Cold War. And that makes you think about what do you really want. And a lot of the story in 1989 is a story about what people thought they really wanted. Helmut Kohl, George Bush, and how they took advantage of opportunities to realize those dreams. But that is just as true today as it was then. And one way in which it's very important is the interaction between governments and public opinion. Public opinion is not some inert mass that follows its own course, and governments can affect it only at the margin. The East Germans dominate much of this story, but the East Germans were very aware of what governments were doing. Indeed, they had been told for years and sincerely believed that unification was not something to be asked for because it wasn't in the cards. It was just not going to be possible. There's a lot of evidence of this belief, both in West Germany and in East Germany. What happened in 1989 was that in many years before, and Karl Kaiser has captured this admirably in his comments, people dug channels through which change might flow. And as the decades passed, the channels were disused. Moss grew in them. No one really noticed them very much. And then in 1989, the dam broke. And those channels that had been dug between 1945 and 1955 acquired enormous significance as Dr. Kaiser has described. When in November 1989, Helmut Kohl then changed the agenda, that had a tremendous effect, which is actually observable in East German public opinion, about their sense of what was possible, as that began destabilizing the communist reform government of Hans Modrow. In early 1990, as East Germans prepared for the first time they could vote in a democratic election since 1932, Helmut Kohl again, with his coalition behind him, helped to define what was possible. Instead of a gradual coming together of the Germanys, he struck out and said, we want rapid annexation immediately, where West Germany will simply take over East Germany. That was bold. It split the political climate, but it gave the East German people a concrete choice. Seeing that choice, they reacted, and the result was the momentous election result of March 18, 1990. Government officials can mold and change public opinion, not completely, but they should not underestimate their ability to redefine the parameters of the possible. The third remark I'd like to offer you, which is in part a comment to my students, I'll just say, details, details. Little details. One little detail, for example, is how to go about announcing a change in the travel laws in your country. I heard, uh, uh, the story of how the Berlin Wall came to be open has got to be one of the great stories in the history of public administration. This is the most colossal administrative error in the long checkered history of public bureaucracies. And mostly it has to do with how to draft the statement at a press conference. Because the East German government didn't intend to open the wall, 
the protesters didn't intend to rush the wall. Everything that happened that night was unplanned and unforeseen, set in motion by the misunderstanding of what someone said at a press conference. And as he was driving home, oblivious of what he had done, tens of thousands of people were rushing in the middle of the night to the Berlin Wall, confronting border guards who were utterly bewildered. It's an interesting story, and I won't try to finish telling it. Details, details. It's a point that our students hear a little bit about at the school, and just one worth underscoring. And I'll conclude by saying my final comment is, don't be a Whig. Now what I mean by don't be a Whig is I'm alluding to something that Sir Herbert Butterfield called the Whig interpretation of history. The Whig interpretation of history had to do with historians in the 19th century writing about the progress of English democracy. And basically this is a way of viewing history whereby history unfolds inexorably bound to produce the events in the present day as the inevitable result of some principle of progress. Maybe that is the inevitable rise of freedom, or the inevitable aspects of an information age, or the inevitable triumph of free market economics. There are many different principles of progress. And the notion is, sooner or later, history is bound to unfold in a way that reflects the supremacy of this principle. This is a Whig interpretation of history. And it's nice to read history from what you see now in the present back so that the whole past is reinterpreted as if it was meant to unfold in the present day. It's nice, but it's wrong. It, complete, it drastically underestimates the profound indeterminacy of many great events. It overlooks the role and the catalytic role sometimes played by individuals, maybe even not too well-known individuals, in shaping, channeling historical forces that can produce quite unforeseen results. And it really is in some ways the most important and profound story that this book has for the present day. Is don't look on this story as something that was bound to happen and it didn't matter who was in charge and it didn't matter what policies government adopted. It was pretty much bound to turn out this way. It would be wrong. It would be wrong because you'd overlook a lot of the details about how it turned out that are momentously important, like the timing of when unification happened before the federal German elections of 1990, like the fact that Germany was annexed into the current Federal Republic of Germany, destroying the East German state rather than recreating an entirely new German Republic, which was the original unification plan, like the way Germany is integrated into NATO, like the fact that American forces and even their nuclear weapons stay while all Soviet forces are gone. Those details are consequential. And those details are over and overlooked by Whig interpretations of history. And now today, when we think about, as citizens, what governments should do, don't give in to a Whig interpretation that says, it doesn't matter. Progress will triumph. The good principles will inevitably prevail. They might not. That's why it's your duty as citizens to care about what governments do. And in a macro sense, that's what justifies the existence of this school. Our speaker tonight is Condoletta Rice, the co-author of this great book. Thank you very much. Well, Carl has mentioned that in 1989 we were sitting along the Rhine discussing events in the Soviet Union, and it is indeed true that we were not thinking about uh, anything like the remarkable events that we would see. As a matter of fact, those events are so extraordinary that they have made people like me something of a dinosaur. Um, the first book that I wrote is a book called The Soviet Union and the Czechoslovak Army. Neither of those countries actually exists anymore. So things have moved along rather rapidly in the last uh, few years. And indeed, I think when we look back on German unification, when Philip and I looked back on German unification, you had to be struck by several things about it. It's already been mentioned, it's incredible speed. Uh, its incredible peaceful nature. I think that it is often forgotten that there were 390,000 Soviet troops in the middle of Europe. Uh, it does not have to say that this had to be done peacefully. Given the confusion in the East German state as it indeed declined and died away, uh, it did not have to happen in a peaceful fashion. Indeed, the sense that 
great courses of events are somehow inevitable, what I think Philip would attribute to the Whig uh, interpretation of history, that things had to work out this way, is really uh, exposed by looking at the way that German unification worked, at looking at the hard work that was done to make sure that it was carried out in the way that it was, and perhaps most importantly, returning, as Philip said, to the details that mattered a lot about how Germany unified. And what I'd like to do is to take just a moment to take us back a little bit and to try and think about how different Europe might have been had Germany unified differently than it did. Because it's all too easy now to sit and watch NATO preparing for action in Bosnia with German forces at the core alongside American and indeed French and British forces. It's all too easy to see a cooperative Russia ready also to send forces uh, with NATO to try and solve the Bosnian events. And to think that uh, the end of the Cold War had to produce an outcome or had to be done in a way that would make those outcomes possible. So suppose for just a moment that the West had chosen instead to take what at times after the fall of the wall seemed like the easier route for German unification. And that was to think about some unification of Germany, of East and Western Germany coming together in some new state, perhaps cutting some deal on NATO so that Germany looked more like France in NATO. There were even suggestions from the Soviets at one point that perhaps Germany could belong simultaneously to the Warsaw Pact and to NATO because this problem of how to think about the political military alignment of Germany, of the new united Germany, was in many ways at the core of the negotiations and the discussions about how Germany would unify. I can tell you that I came to Harvard University in January of 1990 and I gave a talk right upstairs and I said that uh, the Western view, indeed at that time the American view, was that Germany ought to unify as rapidly as it wished on German terms, and most importantly, that Germany had to unify fully integrated into the military structures of NATO. And my colleagues almost laughed me out of the room because it was really believed that somehow this would be so unacceptable to the Soviet Union that you had to find some other way to think about the German role in NATO. But indeed, the West held fast and instead, Germany was integrated fully within NATO. Secondly, there were those who believed that we needed somehow to cut a deal with the Soviet Union about American forces in Europe and in Germany in particular. That one needed to create some parallelism as Soviet forces went home, that American forces ought to, ought to offer to go home as well, so that you would leave Germany without foreign forces. And indeed, it was the steadfast position of the German government, the West German government, and the United States, and indeed with the support, the strong support here of the British and the French, that there would be no parallelism between American and Soviet forces, that American forces belonged in Germany, and that Soviet forces ought to go home. That, too, was a critical decision on the future of Germany. Thirdly, there were many people, particularly in the Soviet Union, who thought about perhaps putting some new constraints on Germany, the singularization of Germany, making certain that you had fetters on a Germany that might get too big again for the center of Europe. Whether it was on uh, Germany's desire to have armed forces of a certain size, or whether it was to have Germany take some pledge about what German foreign uh, and military policy would be, it was the view of German and uh, German, West German and alliance powers that indeed Germany ought to emerge from unification fully sovereign, fully in control of its own future, and that any commitments that Germany wished to make on, for instance, the size of its armed forces ought to be made as a matter of German choice, not as a matter of a four-power treaty on Germany. Again, a very important decision during German unification 
that has had tremendous impact on the Europe that has emerged. And finally, there was the issue of Germany within Europe, and I think that Carl has talked about the acceleration of the, uh, Maastricht, the Maastricht Treaty and the acceleration of European unification so that Germany would be unified within Europe. So what you had at the end of German unification was an Atlantic Europe with the United States still there, with NATO still intact, not a Europe that looked like something unrelated to the 40 years to which Karl Kaiser referred. That has been enormously important in how Europe has evolved thus far and will evolve. Now, indeed, the most interesting part of this, and indeed the great irony, is that none of this could have happened without the Soviet Union. And yet, what German unification in this particular form really also meant was the end of Soviet power in Europe. And indeed, I decided to try and write a book about German unification when I was standing behind Secretary Baker as he signed the document on German unification on September 12, 1990 in Moscow. And I caught a glimpse of Gorbachev out of the corner of my eye, and he was rather tucked up uh, around some aides. He was not front and center. He was the only head of state there. As a matter of fact, the ceremony was incredibly anticlimactic. It, had, it was unlike ceremonies that had been held for arms control treaties and trade treaties with lots of fanfare. It was held in a hotel in Moscow, and it was terribly anticlimactic. But there was Gorbachev, and the look on his face was actually not one of worry or concern. I think I would describe it as simply blank. And I asked myself, how must the leader of the Soviet Union feel at this moment with the unification of Germany and indeed the end of Soviet power in Europe? Because after all, the GDR was the anchor of Soviet power in Europe. It was the frontline forces. It was the most reliable ally. It was the anchor of Soviet power in Europe. And indeed, I've come to believe that Gorbachev had a vision for Europe in which there could be a unified Germany. But that vision of Europe was not the Western vision of Europe. Rather, it was a Europe that was a pan-European Europe, where the Soviet Union would be simply the far-left cousin, a kind of reformed socialism out there, the far-left cousin of European socialism, running all the way from Soviet communism cleaned up Leninism, as Gorbachev would have referred to it, all the way out to social democracy. And indeed, he talked in exactly those terms, as if the Soviet Union, Soviet communism, was just a kind of second cousin of European socialism. And so for him, the key was to have reformed socialism spread throughout Eastern Europe, little Gorbachevs, if you will, all over Eastern Europe. And in fact, what he learned was there, there was no room for communism, at least Soviet-style communism, in Eastern Europe. But that when the Poles or the Hungarians or the Czechs were actually asked what they thought, they thought the Soviet Union ought to go home, and they thought communism ought to go home, too. That in and of itself ended up in the unraveling of Soviet communism all the way back to Moscow. And when you think about it, the great irony of this period is that the Soviet Union, which begins the period, as a troubled but still great power, ends up with the collapse of the Soviet Union roughly at the borders of Russia at the time of Peter the Great. That in itself is a tremendous irony, but it leads me to my last point, that given that history, it could have been an embittered Soviet Union that turned into an embittered Russia, certainly not a Russia that would be willing to participate in Bosnia, certainly not a Soviet Union that just a few months after German unification actually voted with the United States and the alliance in the Gulf War crisis. And perhaps one of the greatest testimonies to statecraft then is that all of this was done in a way that still managed to preserve the dignity of the Soviet Union, that managed to show the Soviet Union a Europe quite different from the Europe that it had imagined, but in which the Soviet Union would still have a role, and that it was able somehow, therefore, to leave Europe undoubtedly with scars, but no open wounds as a result of, I think, one of the great events of the second half of the 20th century. Thank you very much.
thank you very much for four splendid speeches. We'll take questions now for the next uh, quarter of an hour or so. So uh, would people be kind enough to come to the microphones if they'd like to ask a question? And uh, we'll take them in the order one, two, three. So uh, would I, may I ask questioners if they'd like a particular member of the panel to respond, if they'd be kind enough to say to whom their question is addressed. And may my panel stay seated. There's no need to come back to the podium. Our first questioner, will you give us your name and please ask the question. Hi, my name is Ben Kahn. Um, I wanted to ask about the change that Professor Zelico spoke of from attempting to integrate East and West German systems and economies and fairly quickly to the sort of annexation by West Germany of East German institutions and processes very quickly as opposed to just fairly quickly. Um, my understanding is if you spoke to the people who led the East German demonstrations early on in the process in 89, uh, that many of them were very discouraged later when unification happened so quickly that a lot of the things that they thought were good about the East German system were cast aside. And I wanted to know if the motivations for speeding up this process were solely uh, concern that the Soviet Union would backtrack on its agreement to allow things to go forward, or if there were also domestic political considerations in West Germany, um, for example, Kohl's party that thought that it would benefit from a very speedy unification. Perhaps I should ask Philip to start. I'll start, but I, I think really my German colleagues must finish. Um, our motivation um, was uh, was can be summarized in two simple ideas. The first idea is uh, we have seen two German republics, um, the Weimar Republic and the Bonn Republic. Um, the Weimar Republic did not turn out so good. Uh, the Bonn Republic turned out good. This is 50-50. So then you ask this, let, do we want to invent yet a new republic? And you kind of look back and says, we don't like these odds. So then the, there's a fundamental assumption that uh, rather than try out and see if we can invent some new republic, I don't know, maybe it would have been called the Erfurt Republic or whatever, um, or the Berlin Republic, if you will. Let's just stick with the Bonn Republic. Uh, it, it works well. Um, and that was actually not the original intention in the late 40s and early 50s. The reason they called their constitution the basic law is because it was conceived of as an interim document until the constitution was finally written by a National Assembly of all the Germans. But uh, it was the American view that let's not try to rewrite the basic system of governance for the German people. The second simple idea was the Americans were already, by late 1989 and certainly in early 1990, acutely conscious of the fact that they had an opportunity with Gorbachev and that that opportunity could come to an end at any time, that the forces of reaction were already gathering in the Soviet Union, Quite secretly, a contingency group to consider those dangers had already been created in the government entirely unknown to the public in late 1989. And therefore, um, as Cole put it, actually, we have to gather the hay before the storm. Um, we knew that uh, we were actually not going to be able to decisively control whether that reaction would happen. It would primarily be a product of domestic forces outside of our control. And so what we needed to do was go very fast. And the danger, of course, by going very fast with the positions we had, we actually could make the reaction more likely. And there was a judgment largely implicit that it was better to go ahead and try to get our objectives even at that risk. Mr. Ambassador? Only one very short remark. Uh, I don't like this word annexation so much. Even after five years, let's call it a friendly takeover. <laughs> because there's no hostility applied, and what we did, we did it accordingly to the wish of the people of the DDR. Paul Kaiser. When, at the end of November, Chancellor Kohl presented his 10 points, the idea behind it was to create some kind of perspective in a situation of growing turmoil. The idea was to, to, have, to, have, to have some some vision for those who want to change. And at that time, the assumption still was the two states have to grow together. And what changed uh, the, the perspective in Bonn and elsewhere was what happened in East Germany. I think that is, that is the crucial part. What happened in the demonstration, there was a total change of atmosphere, 
and uh, then the dynamics, uh, from, so to speak, from below took over, and then uh, the Germans had to, the West Germans had to offer something else. And then, indeed, uh, although there was a split, the overwhelming majority said, we will adopt the West German model, we let East Germany join West Germany, rather than having a constituent assembly and work out a new, a new uh, constitution. And at that time, Bonn had understood, by the beginning of 1990, that there was a window of opportunity, a time window which would be closed, looking at Moscow. Professor Rice? I would only add on the uh, window of opportunity um, that one concern, it was a very delicate balance. You wanted the Soviet Union to be strong enough and coherent enough to sign away its four power rights and responsibilities, but not so strong as to be able to resist. And uh, that's actually a fairly, fairly narrow window. Well, is there a question up there? No. Yes? No. I'll come to you. Ken. Hi, my name is Christopher Hartwell. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and this is for uh, Ambassador Kroborg and Dr. Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser alluded earlier to uh, the growing isolationism in America, especially through the Republican Party, such as Contract with America. And I wondered if you saw such a backlash coming to the fore in Germany, possibly through the resurgence of the PDS, or um, through problems with the guest of Ita and problems with the assimilation of Eastern Germany. Do you see such an isolationist backlash occurring in Germany anytime soon? I don't see it at all. And I wouldn't uh, call it isolationism, what's going on here in the United States. It might be partly neo-isolationism in the Congress, in parts of the Congress. But this government is very much inclined to fulfill its obligations to the outside world. And for Germany and for Europe, I think this is a world which doesn't fit at all. We are open to our outside obligations. We are accepting more responsibilities in Germany. As I just mentioned, the fact that we are getting involved in Yugoslavia shows that we are willing to accept our responsibility, our worldwide responsibility, and that's just the country of isolationism. There has been, when you look at the last two or three years, a constant evolution uh, of German thinking and German politics on the issue. When you look at the participation of the German armed forces in multilateral action, they range from uh, the minesweeping in the Gulf War to Cambodia to Somalia to, uh, to Bosnia and now indeed to a mission which involves elements of fighting, which is a crucial threshold. The Bundestag today voted with a, an enormous majority, including the Social Democrats, with the exception of 30 dissidents from the left-wing core, an endorsement of the, um, of the government proposal to, to take part in Bosnia, and that includes tornado planes. Uh, and that was very hard for the Social Democrats, but it shows evolution. And if you look at public opinion, about 60% uh, endorse NATO participation, and 52% endorse German participation. Totally unthinkable three, four years ago. There is a slow evolution, so I don't see that there is isolationism, although there will continue to be groups uh, in the Greens, in the PDS, and possibly on the left wing of the Social Democrats, who will oppose. Professor Wright? I would just say that even in the United States, I think there is some isolationism. I also think that uh, it, it, it's not entirely isolationism. Some of it is just unilateralism. Uh, there are people who would be very happy for the United States to throw its weight around in the world, but doesn't particularly care about uh, niceties like allies, or alliances, or the United Nations. And I think that it, it, you know, the United States in the 19th century was actually not isolationist, or it wouldn't be so big. It, in fact, was unilateralist in the way that it went about its business. And so I think that uh, that's also something to watch and to concern ourselves with. Even those who are particularly interested in foreign policy think there ought to be a strong American ro role in the world. The underlying tenor is that uh, we perhaps can do it alone. And I think that's an even more dangerous trend, in fact. Thank you very much. Next question. Good evening. My name is Philip Hacker. I'm a visiting student at the college from Germany, and I would like to address the two German speakers. You've mentioned both internal and external factors or reasons that led to or enabled the peaceful unification of Germany. How do you value or judge the role of the Ostpolitik under Willy Brandt and Genscher, in fact, in the uh, mid-70s? That's, uh, that's what I mentioned, I referred to in my speech. 
uh, I think it is very, very important to go back as far, and Professor Kaiser did the same. The CSE process had been developed in Germany by Germans, by the German government, led to an infight within the coalition, as you remember, and this new Ostpolitik, leading, or, which became later on the CSE policy, finally paved the way for everything which happened afterwards, because we achieved to found a, a, a atmosphere of confidence, to create an atmosphere of confidence in Europe, including the Russians, uh, explaining or giving, giving or, or setting up principles in Europe uh, and made it possible for the Soviet population and the Eastern population to refer to something, to human rights, to freedom of speech, freedom of press, and so on. And we, we started an, an evolution in Europe, which finally led to the to what we achieved, uh, might, uh, I, I, I want to say, I, I mean, the, we overcame the division of Europe and we reached European unification or only German unification. That's so important. I think the, what Willy Brandt did with this new Ostpolitik and with Genscher and the German government then did with the, within the CC policy. It is of a tremendous importance, and I mentioned the fact that it was very difficult for us sometimes to convince our partners in Europe and especially in the United States to follow us. And Baker, this famous letter of, Secretary of Jim Baker, was the first signal from the United States that they understood what this process meant and where it could potentially lead to. And I think this was a breakthrough. And finally, what happened afterwards was based on what we have developed in Europe in the past. Okay. <clears throat> the two great innovations of post-war German policy were Western integration and the Ostpolitik. The Western integration was pursued by Adenauer and the CDU, very much fought by the Social Democrats, then adopted. The great innovation of Ostpolitik was innovated by Willy Brandt, then with the support of the Free Democrats, fought by the CDU, then adopted by the, by the Christian Democrats. So that unlike the Weimar Republic, uh, on the major issue, uh, the unification of Germany, the two big political families can claim that they have both made an indispensable contribution, which I presume is a good basis for the future. All four speakers, um, my name is John Simon, I'm a second year student uh, at the Kennedy School. All four speakers talked about the Cold War having ended, but I'm wondering if the, it is possible that the Cold War is only in hiatus. The Russians go to the polls in a week and there's uh, predictions that nationalists and former communists are are supposedly supposed to make major gains. Uh, my question is, what can the West, what are the prospects of uh, restarting of antagonism between the former Soviet Union and the West? And what, how can the West uh, forestall or foreclose that possibility? Let me start with Dr. Ice on this one. Well, I, I don't think that uh, we will see a Cold War again for any time uh, soon if you consider the Cold War to be a very specific set of events, and particularly if you consider it to have been centered around the division of Europe with Soviet forces deep into the heart of Europe, which is how I define the Cold War, or the, the political basis of the Cold War. I think that that time has passed uh, for a very long time to come because I don't see Russia as having uh, that kind of power projection capability for a long time to come. But I think you quite rightly point to the possibility for antagonism with uh, the new Russian state. I think that there was a rather euphoric period uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in late 1991, uh, really through 1992, where Russia didn't quite yet have her bearings about what Russian national interests would be and got into a, a bit of a, a habit of sort of defining them through uh, the notion that whatever the relationship with the West needed to be, well, that's what Russian national interests were. Well, I think that that position is completely gone, and it's gone across the political spectrum. It does not matter whether you're talking about Gaidar or Yevlensky or talking about Levitt. The notion that Russia should see her national interests through a Western prism is simply gone in Russia. That means that there may be some conflicts. Now, how intense those conflicts will be depends a great deal, I think, on the character of the Russian state and particularly what the outcome is of Russia's relations with her neighbors. 
The more democratic Russia is inside, I think the less threatening she will be to her neighbors, and that will then have a basis for the integration of Russia into Europe, because she will not appear so threatening to Ukraine or the Baltic states. A harder line government in Russia, I think, will have just the opposite effect, which is that you will begin to see a lot of pressure on Russia's neighbors. Indeed, the pressure on uh, the states like Georgia now, or the pressures on Kazakhstan now, are quite intense, and I think any hardening of Russian interests to the right will simply exacerbate that problem. But while I don't see Russia as uh, sort of extending her power into Europe, I think this is really the critical question, and that's the foreign policy dimension of why the United States and the West has a very strong interest in Russian uh, democracy. We will still have conflicts even with a democratic Russian government because it will see its interests differently. But how it treats its neighbors, I'm quite certain, uh, will be fundamentally different. I'd like to get every questioner in, so let me say to my panel, if you feel burningly that you have to add to an answer, please indicate. If you don't feel burningly, I'll move on to the next questioner. You're all content. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, next questioner, Jens. Good evening. My name is Jens Waltman. I'm a German student at the Kennedy School. Um, we have focused very much tonight on the major post-war powers, um, post-World War II powers in Europe. Um, and I would like to ask the whole panel, really, um, whoever would like to pick up the question, where you see the role of smaller um, countries who used to be part of the Warsaw Pact, who with very bold action um, actually started the, the movement of East Germans to the West. I'm thinking of Hungary and the very, very bold move of the Hungarians to take down their border controls, to open their border to, to Austria, and to get this whole notion going. I'm thinking of Prague and the fact that the, uh, that the Czechoslovak police did not stop East Germans from entering the, um, the compound of the German embassy there. So these two small countries that are less mentioned in this context seem to have made a very big contribution. I would like to hear how you see that. Perhaps you should look at the authors yes. to comment on this. Well, let me, let me begin. I, I believe that uh, everyone owes a great debt to the Czechs, the Hungarians, and indeed the Poles, who tested the limits in ways uh, that I think confronted Gorbachev with the, the really hard question. Was he prepared to accept not just reform socialism, but was he, ref was he prepared to accept the absence of socialism? or communism in Europe. So I think they're owed a great debt. And my own view is that they ought to be as thoroughly and as completely integrated into Europe as possible. Um, I think that uh, in some cases you have economic progress that we would not have expected. Uh, five or seven years ago, the Czech Republic, for instance, but even in Poland, where it's an up and down matter, I think Poland is much better off than we had any right to hope in 1989. And indeed, they made very brave economic moves in September of 1989, really the only state to have gone through shock therapy in the, in the way that it was proposed. So I think that uh, Europe owes them a great debt and ought to integrate them fully. My own view also is that uh, while the United States can be helpful, that it is really the community that has to be the draw here. And I'm hoping that it will be an open European community that will think hard about how to integrate these economies, even if they are not members of the community. I think that one of the most hurtful things that happened to the Poles was to be told that their agricultural products uh, couldn't be accepted on, uh, what was it, one half of one percent because of objections uh, and tariffs. Uh, that is no way to welcome uh, a newly democratized uh, friend into uh, the community of free and democratic states. And so I, I do hope that there will be a strong effort to integrate them. I myself am also personally favorable toward their integration in NATO, though I think it has to be carefully thought through, and I think it should take some time. I do not believe that you want to leave a quote-unquote buffer zone uh, should there be trouble again um, in Russia. Philip, would you like to add to that? No, I'll pass. Okay. okay. Right. I couldn't agree more. I mean, these countries will become members of the European Union and NATO. Uh, we committed ourselves. We need a little bit more time to solve our own structural problems within the European Union, especially the agricultural policy, which can uh, like explode the whole European Union, by the way, because for France, the agricultural policy is the main pillar, the main reason, raison d'etre. Uh, of the European Union. That means we have to do a lot of homework first, but the commitment is very clear. They will be members of the European Union, and either before we can achieve this objective or 
afterwards, I think before even they will become member of NATO. That's also quite clear, but as you rightly said, we must do it, we must process in a way not to destabilize, destabilize the eastern part of Europe, and here I refer to Russia, because whatever we do should bring stability to the central part of Europe, the eastern part of Europe, and not destabilize this very crucial and difficult and sensitive area. Our last question, Dengler. Sorry, I'm being brutal, but you did pass, Philip. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no second chances. <laughs> My name is Fahed Dengler, and it has been mentioned tonight that quick unification was possible because it was embedded in European integration in Maastricht. But it is also true that the hard piece of Maastricht, the monetary union, is unfinished business. Um, now, if we assume for a second that monetary union falls through, for example, because there's not enough public support in Germany and other countries, what effect would that have on the European identity of Germany? And what, what effect would it have on the stability of the European Union and the buffer? States. Who would like to find a car? I'd love to. Uh, if the European Monetary Union falls through, it is not because of opposition in Germany. Uh, although there is a general, uh, probably in the opinion, a majority against, the uh, political class and the majority of the economic class is firmly uh, for it for very solid economic reasons. Uh, if it doesn't come about, it is possibly for um, reasons of absence of enough partners. Uh, even if it were to fail in the immediate round, I think the project as such uh, remains important. Um, a, a market of this importance, with a world competition as it is, needs a common currency. So it will postpone the, the issue if it fails in this round of 99, but I don't think it's going to end the debate. Right. I said to my panel that they could all have two minutes at the end. We've now reached the end, so may I take off and ask if anybody else would like to wind up at the point we've now reached. So may I begin perhaps with, well, I'll end with the ambassador if I may. So perhaps I can turn to yes, Condoleezza sir. Rice, Philip, Carl, and then end with the ambassador. I give him the final word. Only one. Oh, he's taking oh, the first. Oh, sorry, I was going to give you the final word. Yes. the final word, Mr. I was, I was graciously giving you the sorry. final word. Dr. Rice. I would just like to say a, a word about uh, European-American friendship and German-American friendship in particular because I think that uh, we've gone through 40 years and we've come out of the other side, uh, 50 years, and we've come out of the other side really in quite terrific shape. If you would have asked yourself if the Cold War could have ended in this relatively peaceful, tranquil way given all of the heat over all of those years, you would have thought not. And I think that at the core of it, at the core of the story that Philip and I have tried to tell, is really a story about German-American friendship and trust that had been built over a very long time that served us very well when the opportunity was there to finally unify Germany. I do think that as we look to the future and as uh, Germany tries to define a, a new role for herself quite rightly and as the United States thinks about uh, what her role will be in the post-Cold War world, that we need to redouble our efforts to strengthen those bonds of friendship, to strengthen the relationship. I don't need, mean around specific issues. I don't mean around Bosnia or around questions of uh, aid for Central Europe. I really mean the bonds of uh, two peoples that uh, know each other quite well. I was heartened to see so many students here from Germany. I believe that one of the reasons that we've had this wonderful friendship is that there's been exchange between the peoples over the last uh, several years. Um, it's not going to be easy because the United States is evolving and is a changing place. I am one person who is myself not of European origin. And uh, I often say to people who are not of European origin, but you should know and you should understand Europe because your political values, whether you like it or not, are of European origin. And if nothing else, those political values, which are at the center of democracy and the center of what we are as Americans, I think served us well in ending the Cold War. I think they will serve us well in looking to the challenges of the future. But as with anything else, it isn't inevitable. And we have to work at it. We have to work at it very, very hard. And I hope that that's understood uh, on college campuses and in governments as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I recognize Philip. Next. I like Condi's theme so much, I'm just going to reinforce it, um, because uh, I'd like our audience to just appreciate how fortunate we are. The United States today sits right at the top 
of the hierarchy of the world's political power, economic power, and military power. Um, I do not take for granted that we should sit atop all these hierarchies. We do that in combination with actually a fairly small number of great powers, Britain, France, Germany, Japan, with sort of a seat at the table that's being held open for Russia. Russia just kind of stands next to that chair, doesn't really quite want to sit in it. Um, China is not yet at that table. That's really a fairly small number of countries that are really the, uh, uh, almost every international policy that's happened in the last few years happens because those countries want it or don't want it. And when you think about that hierarchy and the values that are represented by that hierarchy, and then you think about the fact that actually the majority of the people in the world don't live under those values and don't think they're atop this hierarchy. I don't take for granted that uh, that two, three billion people are going to be content with this hierarchy indefinitely. Because for a lot of people in the world, this is a hierarchy of values and economic organization that basically says for generations, at least for this generation, you're not going to be as rich and powerful as we are. And I'm not sure everybody's going to say, well, that's okay. So when I, and I actually think the United States values and the United States position on this hierarchy is a good thing. Maybe that's partly because I'm an American. Maybe it's partly because I subscribe to certain political values. But then I look around and I look at who else do we rely on to make this possible? And I don't really see too many other people at that table. I think the great question for the 1990s, it's always an important thing to keep your eye on what really matters. The great question of the 1990s is whether Russia is going to join us at that table or set up a new table of its own. And there will be a lot of people who will be happy to sit at another table. I think the next decade's great question is going to be the position of China. But right now, the great question, I think, in world order is whether or not Russia accepts and joins this hierarchy, although it involves painful trade-offs for them. But the indispensable partners in this venture are really three, four absolutely crucial countries. And if we don't work together with those countries, everything we hope for in the world, all these hierarchies are in the gravest danger. So I basically wanted to reinforce Condi's theme, but give you a sense of perspective of our good fortune and the things that we have to think about in order to preserve it. Thank you very much, Philip. Carl? I think I'm going to add another variation of the same theme. First of all, indeed, we are fortunate that the result of this moment of extraordinary historical turmoil resulted basically in a continuation of what we have built up in the post-war years. It could have come out differently. It did not. We basically preserved the best of the institutions that we have built up in the post-war period, the essence of cooperation in the transatlantic world, and the essence of a totally new system of interstate relations in Europe. Um, so that provides not only a good basis, it w I would argue, it is the indispensable basis to face the anarchical world that we have entered. Because the end of the Cold War not only ended problems that we wanted to end, like the division, like repression uh, in, in the eastern half of Europe, but it brought upon us new problems that are very grave. Uh, it is a world of open borders, a world of interdependence, and if we do not succeed in preserving, so to speak, the core of a functioning system of peaceful relations that we have, relations where war is excluded. It's an extraordinary achievement uh, in relations among states. That's the Atlantic world and that's the West European world. We will fail uh, in providing a minimum of order uh, for, the, for the coming years, for the post-Cold War era. And in that sense, the American-European relationship is absolutely essential. And while, and here I agree with uh, Philip, uh, there are other powers, too. Um, it is not clear uh, where they will go. Russia, we'll see what will happen. China is not yet a partner at all. We've seen that in North Korea, where China refused to cooperate in an energetic non-proliferation policy. Uh, Asia is, a prob is, is an area in which there are some partners, but there's enormous diversity. There's the potential of great conflict in the area. Uh, the U.S. does not have balanced trade with Asia. With Europe, it has balanced trade. It has a trade that is roughly equal in quality. It has an intensity of institutions and traditions of cooperation which does, which, which does not exist with any other region. So in that sense, 
the, the test of 1989 and 1990 uh, was a test that did much more than unify Germany, did much more than in the division of Europe. It created, so to speak, the basis for facing the new era of world politics, the post-bipolar era, with uh, good instruments. And let's all hope that we'll preserve them. And I'll ask the ambassador. Yes, I would have made the same point as Condi Rice, and I'm grateful for what she said. Uh, let me refer to one remark of Philip Zelikov at the very beginning. You mentioned the fact that during the unification process, our leaders in the United States and the German EU knew what they wanted and that's a political will to achieve their objectives. And I would hope that we, or will hope, that we know these days, and we are living in very crucial times where life is much more difficult, more complicated, the political life is much more complicated than during the Cold War. I would like us to know what we are trying to achieve. I wish that we have and will have the political will to achieve these objectives, and that needs leadership, and we are lacking of leadership. And I really would like the Americans to fulfill this role as a world leader, as the only remaining superpower. And the Europeans need a United States, which is leading, leading in NATO, leading in international conflict management. We can't afford another Yugoslav crisis, and therefore we have to work together to prevent these developments. And leadership is something we, have, we really need, and the United States is the power which should provide this leadership in, within NATO and within the Western family. Thank you. Let me, thank, uh, let me thank our speakers very much, in particular His Excellency the Ambassador to Washington. We wish him very well in his mission here. Uh, let me also thank Carl, and let me finally say to our two authors that the best thanks you can possibly give them is to read their book. It's titled the book. No, buy German... the book. Not only oh, to buy, buy the book. Yes, not just to read the book, buy the book. Yes. <laughs> right.